The following interview was conducted with Gilbert L. Rochon, Chief Scientist, Rosen Center for Advanced Com Computing, and Director of the Terrestrial Obser Observatory for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Monday, October 18, 2010, in Stewart Center. The interviewer was Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome and good afternoon, Professor Rochon. Well, My thank pleasure. you very much. Uh, let's start. Tell us a little about where you were born and your parents in early years. Uh, I was born in New Orleans, Louisiana. Uh, my father was uh, Gilbert Rochon II, I'm the third, uh, finished in pharmacy from Xavier University, class of 1945. Okay. My mother, Ursula Career Rochon, um, was a supervisor of the chemistry laboratories at Xavier University in New Orleans for 32 years. Wonderful. So, uh, we You've all been around academia a while. <laughs> yeah, we grew up on the campus. Uh, I left. Uh, we all went to Blessed Sacrament Parochial School, and uh, I left home when I was 13 uh, to enter the seminary uh, to study for the Catholic priesthood. Okay. So I was four years in Mississippi, and then three years in Iowa with the Divine Word Missionary Society of Divine Word. So. And then you went back to... to I went back to Xavier. I transferred to Xavier University, finished in English. Uh, I um, initially went on to, uh, uh, to uh, Yale University in philosophy. Uh, but then um, after teaching philosophy for a while, I felt this urge to move from uh, theory to practice. So I went through my Obama period as a community organizer in New Haven, uh, inner city New Haven. What and, were you doing there? Uh, I worked initially as the uh, deputy director of the Dixwell Neighborhood Corporation, and they told me I had two primary jobs. One, to raise money for the community and to, under the Edith Green Amendment, uh, to represent the community on various committees and boards of directors as a consumer service re representative. So. Uh, I lucked out. I mean, the first three grants I wrote got funded uh, in economic development, in a uh, uh, treatment for inner city uh, a drug and alcohol treatment facility and community mental health center, and later a uh, fairly large grant at the time to set up a, an employment uh, training and employment placement agency. So that was under all seven of the inner city neighborhood corporations. Wonderful. So I got to the point where uh, I was on so many boards related to health care that uh, I felt that it was, it was at the point where I needed more training. So I went back to Yale and instead of finishing in philosophy, I did a master's of public health at the School of Medicine uh, specializing in health services administration. And uh, from there, I uh, had a choice of uh, uh, graduate programs at Hopkins and UCLA and MIT, and I ended up going to MIT uh, to do a uh, PhD in urban and regional planning with one, con one of the concentrations was uh, international food and nutrition planning and uh, ultimately in international development, regional planning, planning support systems. Wow. You really got quite a bit to do. Right. Yeah. yeah, but after uh, the the day I started, uh, I enrolled at MIT. I got a job offer to uh, uh, as a follow-on to while I was at Yale in the master's program uh, to uh, uh, direct a planning and evaluation for the drug dependence unit at the Connecticut Mental Health Center. So I did that for the two years, and then when I got to MIT, I, I was offered the job to. Uh, direct the Dorchester Mental Health Center. So I had a uh, inpatient acute and chronic population. While uh, you were going 12, to school? Huh? While you were going While to school? While I was going to school. I wouldn't recommend this. Uh, Twelve psychiatrists, uh, social workers, psychologists, uh, two schools for learning, uh, for emotionally disturbed learning disabled children, uh, developmentally disabled unit, uh, detox unit, a satellite clinic at the Dorchester Court to determine uh, competency to stand trial. So after two years of that, and That's with pretty uh, intense. it was, and then but with uh, a lot of um, deinstitutionalization was going on under Dukakis, and money was not being reinvested in ambulatory care, plus uh, 
I was concerned that a lot of the medications that were offered, both the uh, uh, psychotropic and neuroleptic uh, uh, medications, at that time were highly associated with tardive dyskinesia. So I made a switch from mental health to environmental health and took on the job of coordinator of planning and evaluation for the City of Boston's Office of Environmental Affairs uh, in the Department of State and, uh, Health and Hospitals. So went off to Sudan. Uh, now under, are you finished your degree yet? No, nope, no. Nope. Went off to Sudan to do my dissertation research okay. under a uh, uh, United Nations University fellowship. But uh, Transworld Airlines, TWA, lost all my data after three months in Sudan. So, How did that occur? Uh, well, at that time, they said that the box was too big, it had to be checked, and you couldn't make, uh, uh, it was in the days when you had to do a physical copy. This was in 1981. Okay. Yeah. Uh, right. oh, yeah. And so uh, the only copy machines were available were these old Thermofax machines. It was a dollar a page to copy. That would have been several thousand dollars. Plus, you had to provide, in addition to paying for it, you had to provide your own Thermofax roll, which was unavailable anywhere for love or money. So it was lost. They said they were only eligible, uh, liable for $200 per kilo of whatever was lost. So I, at that point, we had uh, our daughter, who was an infant, um, we decided we were going to move back to New Orleans. Um, I, if we could find a job, my wife got a job teaching at Xavier. Uh, I got a job uh, half time at Tulane in the School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine teaching public health. And, and two weeks later, Dillard University offered me to head the, the directorship of the Urban Studies and Public Policy Institute. So I managed to negotiate a joint appointment so, um, and uh, did that for. Four years, yeah. oh, all right. um, replaced Tulane with, uh, uh, after a NASA internship at Goddard with a position at NASA Stennis, and after uh, several years, two years of that with the USDA Forest Service, and then with the Navy Oceanographic Office back in Mississippi, and then they got a contract, uh, North of Grumman got a contract for the DOD High Performance Computing Modernization Program. So they asked me to be uh, initially coordinator of historical black college programs and then the following year for all 11 universities including uh, Minnesota, Oregon State, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and um, I got a uh, internship, uh, well actually it was a, uh, a visiting faculty fellowship at Oxford University in the Environmental Change Unit. So while I was there, I had this epiphany on how I might be able to get my dissertation finished. Uh, and I called my advisor, um, Don Shurn at MIT, and he said, I think that'll work. Because what I proposed to do was, uh, instead of uh, I originally doing a comparative analysis of European, U.S., European, Soviet, Chinese, and Arab investment practices in the agricultural sector in Sudan and the impact of nutritionally vulnerable groups. Well, uh, when I went back to two years later to try to do the study while I was at Dillard, all investors had fled because the Civil War had escalated, mm -hmm. and that just was not possible. So uh, ultimately it occurred to me that I could do use, uh, uh, I had this grant from when Elizabeth Dole was Secretary of Transportation mm -hmm. to develop a, a spill response information system for the Port of New Orleans, the Mississippi River has this chemical and oil spills, and using remote sensing. And they liked that part of the planning grant, so that got funded. And so we got uh, um, 190000 from them, matched from the state of Louisiana, quarter of a million from Digital Equipment Corporation, quarter of a million from AT&T to set up a real-time remote sensing ground station at Dillard University. So it occurred to me that I might be able to use the same technology for the dissertation, basically remote sensing for uh, drought-related famine conditions. Mm -hmm. So uh, he said, uh, well, why don't you come up immediately after you leave Oxford? I said, well, I can't quite do that because I got another grant uh, to get uh, my, bring students as research assistants to Oxford from the Ecological Society of America. And then 
a supplement from uh, IEEE Geoscience and Remote Sensing Society to bring the students to present their findings at the uh, IGARS conference in Singapore. So he said, you're pushing it, but come right after that. I did. Uh, showed up at MIT, called uh, uh, Professor Schoen, got a recording from his secretary saying, unfortunately, he passed away. So at that point, I talked to uh, Bish Sanyal, who was the new chair of the department, and he said, whom I didn't know. He said, well, I heard about you. He said, I have good news and I have bad news. Good news is the committee is working on it, but they, we have not yet established a statute of limitations for the doctorate, okay? Uh, bad news is everybody in your committee is either deceased or emeritus. So you have to take a leave of absence from both of your jobs with, uh, uh, on the high performance computing program at Stennis and at Dillard University. Enroll here, since you weren't enrolled prior to taking, you know, prior to defending the dissertation, it's 150% tuition. Uh, and uh, live in the dorm, stay here the semester you've been teaching by that, uh, you know, and just get it done. Get the other two guys to come out of mothballs, find a new chair within urban planning because they're from other departments. So I talked to Professor Willa Johnson at uh, Political Science. He agreed. Dr. Nevin Scrimshaw, who was the World Food Prize winner, uh, agreed. Uh, and he was in his 80s at the time, he's in his 90s now. And he said, uh, okay, uh, but where are you living? I said, in the dormitory. Uh, he said, uh, Ashdown House. He said, do you have a roommate? I said, yeah, as a, a master's student in toxicology, Mexican-American. He said, it's not gonna work. He said, you're gonna spend your whole time advising this student, you're never going to finish your own work. He said, your department head, your Conrad Hilton endowed professor, you don't have your doctorate yet, so uh, here are the keys to my townhouse in Beacon Hill. I mean, he raised the bar with respect to how one treats one's students, okay, that which I have learned. Uh, my wife and I are at our farm in New Hampshire. Uh, you can stay on the, th on the uh, second floor on the uh, basement. I have, uh, I'm still editor of the United Nations University Food and Nutrition Bulletin. Uh, so there's a secretary, there's a computer, there's a fax machine, there's a copy machine, and there's a library in our field. And if that's not enough, you're one walk across the bridge or one subway stop from Sloan School Library, so you have no excuse. And I was a bit unconfident, you know, it had been so long. I mean, uh, I, I, I enrolled after, right after the masters at Yale in 76. That was a long time ago, right. 76. This was 99, you know. And so he said, uh, well, uh, and on the third floor, my wife and I have our apartment. But we're not going to be there. So when you graduate at the end of this semester, invite your, uh, you know, your, your mother, your wife and kids. They could stay there instead of registering at the Hyatt. So, uh, Wonderful. put uh, uh, shoulder to the wheel and nose to grindstone and finished up. And um, then I got offered a position uh, at uh, the Environmental Protection Agency in Cincinnati, mm -hmm. as uh, uh, eventually as a research team leader in land use and hydrology with a joint appointment teaching uh, remote sensing for planning as an adjunct professor at uh, University of Cincinnati and did that for... Uh, How'd you like Cincinnati? How'd that work out? Oh, it worked yeah, out well. Right. Uh, I, they've had a uh, EPA center there for a long time, I think, in that general region. Yes, I was yeah. the National Risk Management Research Lab. And when uh, attending a supercomputing conference, I ran into Jim Bottom and he, and he was introduced to me by the uh, computer science uh, professor at Boston University and he said oh I heard about you he said you're a candidate uh, to be deputy director at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications at U of Illinois Urbana-Champaign I just came from there and I know they take a long time so can you get your resume into me quickly and I think Purdue might be able to make a a, a better offer and a faster offer and so I did and uh, a couple weeks later got invited for an interview and when an offer came, I told EPA, and they said, can you hold Purdue off by 36 hours? I said, well, it's a Thursday. I tell them, you know, Monday. And, but by Friday afternoon, 
the EPA said, we got approval from Washington to make you a counteroffer. Uh, you're a GS-12, step 10, we'll give you a 13 slash 14, plus uh, a um, lump sum, 25% uh, of salary, lump sum retention bonus for two years. And I, I said, I didn't know that existed. I turned down several positions. <laughs> I would have come to see you guys earlier. But uh, my wife and son were at Penn State, and my daughter was in New Orleans at Tulane. I said, if I took, if I came to Purdue, we could all be reunited as a family. Uh, and my wife did get a job here uh, teaching television production. Both kids were accepted, but uh, my daughter at that time, she said, There's, they don't have a graduate program in international public health at Purdue. I'm going to stay at Tulane. And uh, son said, well, Dad, you and Mom are both teaching there, so it does, you don't double that 50%. You still get 50% salary, you know, 50% uh, reduction of tuition. He said, but uh, uh, Carnegie Mellon offered me 60%, uh, Chicago 75%, and Penn State offered me 100% full tuition for four years plus room and board. So uh, I think I'm going to hang here. And so, uh, but, you know, daughter came back here did a master's at IUPUI, worked with Paul Robinson in the cytometry lab on the, um, on the uh, Cytometry for Life project in Africa. And um, now she's in medical school at Brown University. And uh, the son, uh, after, doing a, uh, after Penn State, did a post back at UPenn and is now a uh, uh, medical student at uh, so also a second year med student at U of Queensland in Brisbane, Australia. Oh, how did he have decided to go there? Well, uh, he, um, he checked it out and U of Queensland was ranked number 42 in the top 200 universities uh, worldwide and uh, Purdue was also respectable in that ranking. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, he, uh, uh, the key things is that, well two things, they, uh, they, they had a strong program in immunology, virology, plus their semester starts in January 1st, so they let you know in November. So you either accept their offer, turn their offer down, wait for April, May, June, July to hear about the U.S. schools. But the important thing for him was that beginning with his class, they had an articulation agreement and certification for Oxford Foundation Hospital in New Orleans. So you spend two years in Australia, you do a rotation at an Aboriginal clinic, and then you start at uh, Oxford okay. for two years. Wonderful. So he's, he would be going back home. Sure. And so... Uh, that sounds really good. Good Yeah, choice, it's, right? it's a, just starting with his class and they're going to escalate the program. Right. So, and it's an excellent place for, uh, for our residencies as well. Sure. So uh, uh, that seemed to work out, but... Uh, we um, now, you, yeah, you tell us about that Purdue. When you first came, so you decided to come to Purdue, and then you were the associate VP for collaborative research and engagement. Right what? under ITAP, and okay. that was uh, so. I've been here eight and a half years. I oh, know. And uh, first thing, time flies. Time flies. Time flies. So they said, "Well, what would you really like to do?" I said, "Well, I had a Purdue was one of the first universities to be involved in remote sensing in the country through LARS." Mm -hmm. Uh, right. Laboratory for Applications of Remote Sensing. Right. But they've been buying their data uh, on an ad hoc basis ever since. And I think what we need is a real-time ground station that would pull in data from multiple satellites, and it could be used on an interdisciplinary basis, and you could use it for time-critical research. Uh, because you can't order data, wait two weeks or a month okay. for it to come in. Yeah. So it could be used for crop forecasting, for meteorological forecasting, for uh, um, anthropogenic and biogenic disasters, whether it's uh, hazardous chemical and oil spills, or uh, floods, storms, tornadoes, hail, uh, forest fires, whatever. And uh, so uh, Jim Bottom said, well, uh, why would that be under ITAP? Why would it be under information technology? I said, well, information central computing needs to be about more than just a data processing and distribution. It should also be about data acquisition, particularly if it cuts across numerous departments. So uh, he agreed to advance a half a million, but it would take another 700 and 
an another 250,000 because it was total 750. So I went uh, and made the case individually to various departments that were users of satellite data and uh, also to uh, their, the deans in some cases. And we were, we were just $25,000 shy thanks to uh, you know, science, engineering, um, agriculture, agronomy, earth and atmospheric sciences, et, et cetera, uh, and uh, civil engineering, geomatics. So uh, not knowing any better, since I was new to the area, I went to IU and talked to the Polar Center at IUPUI, and they put up 50000 so I was 25000 ahead. And so we established the Terrestrial Observatory, right. and uh, then subsequently uh, negotiated with Purdue Press to initiate the Journal of Terrestrial Observation, which is a peer-reviewed right. peer journal, it. open right. source. <clears throat> and um, um, now we, we have, uh, thanks to Larry Beal, who's been with Purdue for 35 years, first with Lars and now as systems manager for the Terrestrial Observatory, he developed Prestige, which is a, uh, a subscription service that uh, any researcher could say, all right, these are the coordinates of uh, latitude, longitude, or universal transverse mercator for my study area. So as the real-time data comes in, they get notified immediately, and they can get access to that data for any time-critical research. Plus, uh, we use uh, C-Space as our vendor, and that came with software to develop 150 data products in near real-time, and that initially 45 minutes after the satellite went over. Subsequently, we were able to purchase a quad, dual quad-core uh, cluster uh, within the Rosen Center for Advanced Computing that allowed us to, uh, uh, to get the same 150 data products in 15 minutes after a satellite overpass. So, Wonderful. Uh, result of this, NATO, uh, we had an opportunity with NATO to uh, get a grant under their Science for Peace program to replicate the Purdue Terrestrial Observatory in North Africa. And we initially attempted to do it in Egypt at Cairo University and al Azhar University, but the Egyptian security agency decided that they were reluctant to have real-time data in the hands of students. So we're now uh, in the process of transitioning the program to Morocco. Okay, okay. that's really it. Currently in the process of transferring right. the uh, project from Egypt to Morocco. So we're hopeful that that will get uh, full approval. Okay. <clears throat> now the uh, senior science, chief scientist at the Rosen Center. Uh, as a senior research scientist at the Rosen Center for Advanced Computing, uh, in that capacity, uh, we were involved, uh, for example, in uh, together with Larry Beal in uh, facilitating a conference at the San Diego Supercomputer Center, a workshop uh, in preparation for the XD Extreme Digital uh, Initiative, which is a follow-on to the Terra Grid, uh, and that's a, a, a project in which Purdue, along with uh, San Diego and Oak Ridge Lab, are finalists in competition with uh, the uh, uh, National Center for Supercomputing Applications at Urbana-Champaign, the Texas Advanced Computing Center at UT Austin, and um, uh, Oak Ridge, oh, produced with Argonne, and they're with Oak Ridge. So it's uh, the clash of the titans, winner take all, 125 million over five years, and uh, so <clears throat> hopefully we will be in the winning team, because the other team will go where they will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Uh, so. That's one initiative. The other is that I've been serving for four years on the uh, uh, science advisory panel for the Arctic Region Supercomputer Center mm -hmm. at U of Alaska Fairbanks, and currently am on the uh, technology advisory board for the uh, Government of South Africa Center for High Performance Computing. So uh, we've, uh, <clears throat> uh, we're optimistic that uh, uh, that uh, in this new role we'll be able to uh, right. upgrade the computational facilities at Tuskegee uh, so that uh, we'll have a, a not only a, a substantial um, uh, high-performance computing center, but also connectivity to uh, the Rosen Center's Dia Grid, uh, which uh, uses Condor 
pools to uh, link various labs around the country, and uh, moreover, will be connected to a uh, uh, to a major gigapop, uh, linking us to XD or the TerraGrid. Wonderful. That sounds very nice. Uh, a couple of adjunct uh, positions that you had. One was with the IU Medical Center, and also this uh, university in Thailand. You make a comment on both of those. Right. Uh, I've um, uh, for uh, uh, initially served as a. Uh, uh, adjunct uh, faculty with uh, the uh, School of Medicine at IUPUI and the Department of uh, Epidemiology and Public Health, uh, basically teaching health services uh, health administration, health systems management. <clears throat> and uh, they got to be a little difficult with travel schedule. I would right. bring in uh, guest speakers uh, when needed uh, because we were also involved in some initiatives with uh, uh, Soho out of Indianapolis, which is saving orphans through health care and outreach. Right. And that was uh, that brought us to projects in uh, in Swaziland and Lesotho and with uh, on the advisory board for the Cytometry for Life project with uh, Professor Robinson. So we traveled not only there but to Nigeria uh, to uh, uh, attempt to uh, Develop uh, interests uh, in in those in handheld device for HIV/AIDS testing. So at uh, at Thailand, I was a senior uh, uh, specialist, um, Fulbright uh, specialist uh, at the May Falawang University in Thailand. And uh, after my tour of duty there, uh, I was uh, appointed an adjunct professor which meant that I would uh, serve on some dissertation committees, uh, but uh, also was invited back there uh, to be involved in an initiative this past summer uh, to uh, develop a, uh, uh, a proposal that would uh, take advantage of the fiber optic link among the universities and establish uh, a network of real-time remote sensing ground stations uh, for time-critical uh, research. And also, since May Falong University is a secretariat for the Greater Mekong subregion, uh, the initiative involved uh, linking uh, linkages with uh, uh, universities in the uh, universe with uh, in the countries that shared borders with Thailand, and that included Vietnam, Cambodia, Myanmar slash Burma, uh, Lao Lao uh, Democratic Republic, and Southern China. And uh, so, after we put the preliminary plan together, I was asked by uh, the Fulbright Thailand uh, to uh, present our project to uh, Her Royal Highness Princess uh, uh, Sirenhorn, uh, which we did, and uh, to the uh, U.S. Ambassador to Thailand. So we're optimistic that that project will come to fruition. Okay. Well, you'll let us know. We keep in touch. The couple things on your synergistic activity, one is that NATO Science for the Peace Project, your director at, um, for that. Still working with that? Yeah, the Science yeah. for Peace. That's the okay. one that we're making, attempting to, uh, okay. well, we're submitting the proposal to transition from Egypt uh, to Morocco That's to two universities okay. there. <clears throat> then the, uh, the other one was that director of the Indiana View Consortium. Yes, there have been several. Uh, uh, actually, Indiana View is a uh, consortium of 11 universities within the state of Indiana, okay. plus three non-government organizations like IGIC, uh, the uh, Indiana Geographic Information Council, the NASA Space Grant uh, Proposal, uh, 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 Space Grant, sp Indiana Space Grant, okay, uh, and, uh, they're headed by Dr. Barrett Caldwell, and uh, the U.S. Uh, um, uh, actually, it's the Indiana Geologic Survey, and the other is a group called CUSIS, uh, the Council of Universities for Spatial Information Sciences. And that uh, resulted uh, in a grant that, uh, a subcontract that we received uh, to develop 100-year uh, uh, flood models for 800 counties within the United States involving Purdue students in combination with uh, IUPUI and uh, other uh, universities throughout the state in uh, they all together 2,000 counties. Purdue share was 800 counties. So we had students working uh, on uh, uh, two shifts a day and also on weekends in order to get that done over the summer for FEMA, a contract with FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
Yes. Actually, uh, Indiana View is a one uh, of uh, one component of an umbrella organization called America View, which now represents consortia, uh, all related to spatial data analysis and archive distribution and training K through 12 uh, output and research for 37 states in the United States. And the chairman of the board of America View is uh, the systems manager for the Purdue Terrestrial Observatory, Larry Beal. And so that's uh, a um, uh, multi-million dollar initiative. There is a proposal, and it's funded through the U.S. Geological Survey. There is a bill pending before Congress now that has been, that went through the House lopsided bipartisan support, 300-something to 30-something. The Senate Commerce Committee approved the House version unanimously, and it's being held up by one senator. Uh, and if that, we, if he could come to terms uh, with his conscience, uh, then uh, 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 that would uh, allow the, uh, the sharing of data nationwide, including Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, Guam, et cetera, and allow all universities within the United States to share data uh, related to spatial data archives and even real-time data from those of us like Purdue that have real-time ground stations. So we're hoping that uh, that will be approved um, ere long. Okay, keep our fingers crossed. The, um, you're the, the Purdue Research Opportunities Program. PROP, uh, yeah. yes, Purdue Research Opportunities Program. We initiated some five years ago, and that is a program uh, that uh, recruits students who are underrepresented in the STEM disciplines, science, technology, engineering, and math, uh, from primarily from historically black colleges, uh, from uh, uh, Native American tribal colleges, from uh, the Hispanic Association of Colleges and Universities, and also from individuals who are upper, upper underrepresented at uh, majority institutions. We've had students from Vanderbilt University, for example. Sure. And they come in the summer. Uh, they have, uh, for eight weeks, uh, they're provided with a $4,000 stipend. It covers their round-trip airfare, uh, their housing on campus, a mentorship with a uh, Purdue faculty member, an opportunity to publish in some cases, uh, a uh, sponsorship for their involvement at, uh, in presenting a paper or poster at the Big Ten Research Conference, and intensive preparation for the graduate record exam. These are undergraduates? These are undergraduates, okay. usually sophomores, juniors, or seniors. Okay. And they uh, also, if they decide to uh, apply to Purdue, their graduate uh, application fee is waived. So in the last two years, uh, we've had, ITEP has put up the money for PROP, and it's been matched in the past by Intel, by Motorola, and for the last two years by the uh, Indiana Space Grant Consortium, which is headed by Dr. Barrett Caldwell, who's a faculty member in um, industrial, uh, in, in, in industrial engineering. Right. And, but uh, for the last two years, we've uh, collaborated with the Purdue Graduate School's um, Mark Ames slash SROP, Summer Research Opportunity Program, so they manage it uh, and uh, for the last two years. And it's full, it works out better because they've got 40 students right. and we've had, you know, uh, we start off with 15 and sometimes 10, et cetera. But it's folded that way. They have more collegiality right. and students and from a broader perspective yeah. and uh, they have other enrichment programs and social activities so it, it works out better. Uh, but I'm hopeful that uh, with that pro uh, initially when we set up the program, it was through an M uh, X number of slots were reserved for uh, under a, a memorandum of understanding that I helped uh, facilitate uh, between signed by President Jiski and by the then President uh, Boniface Hardin at uh, Martin University in Indiana, which is the only minority serving institution in the state. And so we had several students coming from Martin. Uh, there's been a change in administration there, and we haven't, we've had only one student so far from Martin in the past. So I'm hoping to develop a similar relationship with Tuskegee University so that we could provide a pipeline of students uh, to Purdue. Right, sounds good, okay. Um, Let's talk, do you have a favorite, Purdue, do you have a Purdue tradition since you've been here that sticks in your mind? Purdue tradition. tradition. Like hmm. the Boilermaker special or anything? <laughs> well, then uh, I'll, I'll have to think about that Okay, for, for how about an outstanding event? 
Those uh, may, you can have more than one. Sometimes people say, can I have one? I said, no, you can have more. Okay. Well, um, uh, there, there are any, well, I, I think that uh, uh, the, uh, the outstanding events, plural, right. uh, would be the uh, establishment of uh, a global initiatives in each of the Purdue University, each of the schools within Purdue University. Right. And I think that that is, it's really critical. Purdue has a global brand. It may be a state university, but it's not perceived as such okay. around the world. It, it really is a global university, and I think that the degree to which we could attract students from around the world and play a major uh, development role uh, within, uh, within Africa, Asia, and Latin America is, uh, is really significant. And uh, I think that uh, uh, I have really benefited uh, since ITAP is not a degree granting entity within the university. Um, my graduate students uh, that uh, are supported uh, and postdocs uh, have come from multiple countries and multiple disciplines. And as a result, <clears throat> we're located in, uh, in Discovery Park in, the Ma in Man Hall. And we're able to uh, uh, to really have a, uh, to break down the silos and because some problems are so intractable and so complex that they they require and deserve uh, multiple perspectives uh, in order to uh, to resolve. So we've uh, uh, in tackling such things as uh, as uh, food security uh, issues like uh, identification and mitigation of infectious disease vector habitat, right. uh, <clears throat> these kinds of issues, and poverty eradication, these issues really require uh, interdisciplinary perspectives. Oh, so uh, currently I'm writing a book with one of my uh, uh, former postdocs from political science on uh, <clears throat> the issue of uh, African uh, sustainable development, continental unification, and the role of emerging technologies. Uh, we've been collaborating with Dr. J. Paul Robinson in, uh, in the cytometry lab uh, uh, at Purdue in looking at how hyperspectral analysis uh, can be improved in, at multiple scales. And obviously, we don't read each other's literature. So uh, as a result, um, it takes a long time for breakthroughs on one end to reach the other. But in essence, we're doing the same thing. Right. We're observing how phenomena, uh, no matter how different the scale, absorb, backscatter, or emit light at different segments of the electromagnetic spectrum. And moreover, we use similar algorithms to identify anomalies in the data. Uh, case in point, cytometry uses algorithms developed by David Landgreep 25 years ago for spectral unmixing. Uh, so they could benefit from advances in, uh, in hyperspectral image analysis uh, on the remote sensing end. Uh, conversely, the most that we can do at the terrain level is to uh, use 200 bands of the electromagnetic spectrum for hyperspectral analysis from satellite data. They can, at, at in the cytometry lab, they can get 500 plus variables per cell, per drop of blood. So there's a lot that we can gain right. by collaboration in identifying areas of commonality, no matter how dissimilar the scientific disciplines might appear at face value. Good point. Excellent. And it's really good to see that uh, actually uh, and operational. And it exists. Mm -hmm. And it's working together, which is the key thing. Now, the next stage, the sixth president of Tuskegee University, uh, and we are best wishes. And let me ask you, um, and this is a quote, I think this is nice. I am respectful of what has gone on before at Tuskegee and hope to build upon these, those achievements and its great heritage. I see so much potential at Tuskegee. That's very nice. nice nicely said. Well, I, I think um, how large? How large is the We school? have 3,000 students. Okay. We have a 5,000 acre campus. We have uh, over 100, 000, 100 million in endowment. Um, we have a mandate to increase the student body to 5,000. Uh, there are 155 buildings. We have uh, 155 buildings? Yes. Uh, several of which were built 
by uh, Booker T. Washington and his students and faculty when they who purchased. Who was the first who founded the school? Who found? Who was the founder of the school? The first right. of, and uh, uh, he purchased a uh, uh, hundred acres, built a kiln, and the students and faculty made bricks. They sold bricks uh, in the surrounding area to raise money for the school. And uh, when they got enough. They made more bricks and built the buildings. They hired the first black architect to graduate from MIT to help design the buildings. And there's some marvelous, oh, still like existing that. structures, uh, including the Oaks, which was the president's house, and several of the other uh, buildings that are dormitories and classrooms now. So it's, it's quite, quite special. And, and I feel uh, privileged and uh, a bit intimidated to walk in the footsteps uh, uh, that have gone before me. There have only been uh, five presidents since 1881. That speaks and very well. That uh, on average, uh, it's 25, only once in a generation, every 25 years, do they select a president of Tuskegee. So statistically, I would have had much better odds in being drafted for the NFL because they have several every year, you know, not just one in a, one in a generation, okay? Nice. So uh, it's, a, uh, it's uh, a unique opportunity. It certainly is. How did you, how did you first, uh, did they contact, did someone contact you? Or yeah, apparently uh, they, the first... Um, did they have a search firm? They had, a, they had a search firm. Well, they had an initial search firm a year ago after President Peyton, who had uh, who served for 28 years, uh, he gave them a year's notice, and they formed a search. They hired one search firm, and they had a big 25-member uh, search committee, and that they did not come to fruition. So, uh, in beginning of August, the board of trustees decided they were going to form August a, of this year. August of this year, okay. uh, they uh, at the president extended for a month. And then they they appointed an interim president who would not be a candidate. And then they uh, uh, they hired another search firm, Ayers and Associates, uh, that uh, w was specialized in presidents, chancellors, provosts, sure. and deans. And they uh, uh, they decided that this time around uh, they would have a steering committee, the search committee, which was nine people, uh, including the chair, et cetera, et cetera, <coughs> of the board of trustees. And they, instead of uh, widely advertising, they would contact people who were already employed at major universities with what they thought were, uh, had uh, credentials that coincided with what the board was looking for. So I got a phone call out of the blue inviting me to throw my hat in the ring and apply for this job. And um, uh, they narrowed it down to uh, 20 finalists. And then the final three were invited for an interview. And then uh, I ended up meeting with uh, the full search committee and the board of trustees. And they held a, uh, held a meeting of the board and in, informed me that I was being offered the sixth presidency of the university. And uh, subsequently, that carries with it a uh, uh, appointment to the board of trustees. And day before yesterday, I was. Uh, uh, appointed a tenured university professor. So uh, even though I don't start the presidency until November 1st, uh, I'm on the Board of Trustees and I'm a tenured full professor. <laughs> You're on board. Yeah, I'm on board. <laughs> oh, is, in closing, is there something I forgot to ask or if you'd like, I'll leave it, leave it up to you. Uh, well, I we think that um, one, of the, um, one of the crucial issues uh, is the fact that uh, I've been impressed with the uh, Purdue's relationships with the community. Uh, the town-gown relationship yeah. is, is, is in partnership, and I think uh, Representative Sheila Stingle uh, has had a lot to... Uh, uh, Sheila Clinker? Ch Sheila, uh, I'm Sheila sorry. Clinker? Sheila Clinker has had a, uh, a tremendous impact on that. But uh, also, uh, I, my, it's ironic uh, that... Um, my wife um, <clears throat> served for several years as chairman of the board of directors for the Hannah Community Center here in Lafayette. And we discovered just recently that the founders of the Hannah Community Center were gentlemen now in their 80s and 90s from Tuskegee University. Oh, 
oh who my. came up here to Lafayette and were engaged in that. So I'll be having uh, uh, nice lunch to... with uh, Mr. Hubbard and uh, others uh, in in that in that group uh, before I leave here. And so uh, uh, I think I have I bring with me having studied uh, the uh, tremendously successful capital campaign that uh, President Jiski uh, uh, initiated and uh, also looking at the community development. It's crucial that, uh, that uh, the relationship with, that I use my urban planning and, right. uh, and community organizing background in Tuskegee uh, because uh, we have to, uh, in the words of Mao Tse Tung, walk on both legs and, and have a situation where uh, we not only advance the university but contribute significantly to the sustainable development of the town and the surrounding county and region. Uh, and because uh, in order to, it's, it's high time that a historically black university advance to uh, a Carnegie One research university status. I think Tuskegee is optimally positioned uh, to move to that, uh, uh, to that level. And in order to do that, in order to attract the right people to make that happen, we have to have a, uh, a milieu uh, that is supportive of, uh, uh, with a, a decent uh, a school system, uh, an array of uh, restaurants and housing, et cetera, and a vibrant economic uh, community. And I think uh, that that's, uh, that synergistic relationship uh, needs to be supported on both sides. Yes, that's very, very nicely said. I think you'll do very well, and we want to keep in touch. Absolutely. Okay. You're most kind. Thank well, okay. You. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks very much. All right. <laughs>